again, in my experience, to me, uh, like using these tools just to actually experience his presence, that's kind of huge. To, to actually have a personal, experiential right hemisphere, kind of like the way you get to know a person as a friend. And if you have that kind of interaction with the living presence of Jesus on a regular basis, I mean, that kind of just intuitively, you think that sort of makes sense, right? That's going to, that your, your relationship with Jesus is going to grow and become more important, and your intimacy with Jesus is going to grow if you actually spend time having a, a, a tangible interaction with the sense that he's actually a living person. And that, that's kind of like, oh, right, totally. I mean, people in this room, we can say, oh, my goodness, that would just be one of the most obvious things in the world that's going to do, zoop, is actually spend time with the tangible presence of Jesus. Wonderful. That's all in the middle of what we do. Another piece of what we do, and this is, is getting rid of specific memory-anchored hindrances. <laughs> and to me, this is, one of, this is a really big reason. In fact, I think this is the biggest reason to have a lifestyle of healing, not just a, a lifestyle of a manual, which means you, you learn to keep your relational circuits on, you try to be more aware of Jesus' presence, you use specific tools for appreciating him, for being able to sense his presence, for just seeing his smile, for talking to him. That's all fantastic. But also a lifestyle of healing. I think the number one reason we should have a lifestyle of healing is because as you shovel away at all your old stuff, you regularly hit pieces that you realize, oh my goodness, some of that was getting transferred onto the Lord. There are specific memory-anchored hindrances that get onto God from old trauma that's not resolved. And they don't usually start out with, oh, I have this irrational, distorted perception of God's character and heart. It must be, work it must be anchored into trauma. Occasionally people do that, especially if they've been in the manual for 10 years and they've done lots of healing and they'll, spot, they'll start to spot them. You know. But usually at first, it just feels like, well, this is just true about God. And you've spent your whole life trying to figure out, well, his ways are greater than our ways. And they're so much greater than our ways that when he kills babies, it's good. You know, but that sounds bad and it feels bad, but he's so much better than us that that's actually holiness when he does it. And, you know, the average person who's not, who hasn't already swallowed the blue pill or the red pill, whichever it was in the matrix, that, um, lot, especially in like non-believers, you know, you go to high school or college and you talk to an agnostic and you try to sell that to them, they're just like, you're insane. And part of what that, part of the way that looks is you usually, and I explain all this, you have, if you, if at some level it feels true, this really is the way God works. And it's, again, this is one I know by experience. You know, here I am as a five-year-old. I'm like, I, I read the, I'm reading, well, actually, like seven, I was chewing through the Bible trying to, when I first learned to read. Um, and like, oh my gosh, there's crazy stuff in there. And kind of my, my sort of understanding was like, so this, he's in charge. He's got all the power. We're supposed to love and trust him. And if we don't love and trust him, we like we go to hell. So I basically, this is a big stakes deal. I, I need to find a way to believe that God is good and that I love him and trust him. And you can play, I mean, all kinds of crazy games in your head to try to you know, convince yourself that God is good and what to do with those verses and stuff that are terrifying. And we, as a part of all that, um, the, the more you're really in that, inside that package, you can't even acknowledge to yourself that there's all these places you believe God is scary and crazy and absent and negligent and doesn't hear you and he's too busy and he's just terrifying and unpredictable and whatever, fill in the blank with all kinds of bad stuff. And the way it usually works, especially if you're in that, in that kind of a picture and you grew up in the church and you've got lots of trauma related to scripture and ministry and pastors and all, if you just shovel away regularly at healing, you, as you shovel after something is healed, then it's easy to say, oh my goodness, now that that is, is resolved, I can, I can feel and see that that used to distort my perception of God's character and heart. And that's the, most, that's, that's the usual way it happens, which is why a lifestyle of just regular sessions to work away at your own healing is one of the most important things you can do because you will steadily eliminate memory-anchored hindrances between you and Jesus. And I'll hit a bunch of examples, and if I have a few minutes extra, I'll throw in a little bit more theory. So, examples. So, like the whole the Bible scary God thing. Um, so, for me, um, I go to memories where when dad, when dad was not triggered, he was wonderful. But when he was triggered, and this is what triggering is, 
you, it doesn't make sense, it's not predictable, it's not reasonable. So if you get a little boy and a big dad, and dad gets triggered, it's unpredictably angry and judgmental in ways that feel unreasonable, scary. You know, this is, this is bad to have like the huge guy who's in charge of the world have scary, uh, angry, judgmental reactions that don't make sense, that I can't figure out what the rules are, and they come, they, they ambush you, you don't know when they're coming. And guess what? That's exactly what felt true about God. Every single detail. It's like you put them together and they made one shadow. Every single thing that felt true in the memories of my dad being triggered, every single one of those felt true about God. And for 40 years, you know, I had been, and I, I recognize this is scary. I mean, like, even at, at the level I was able to even acknowledge that some of that's so disturbing and scary and like, wow, God seems bad, you know, and I'm supposed to love him and trust him. And I would try to, you know, read books or sermons or in, in every way I could find, you know, is there any way to understand those scriptures that's not terrifying, you know? And uh, I put thousands of hours into that. I have whole bookshelves, I mean, not books, bookshelves of, of books about, you know, how, what about hell, how can God be good, all the scary stuff in the Old Testament. And what was interesting is no matter, none of that stuff, it always felt like, I wish it was true, and it feels like you're just trying to make an excuse for somebody who's scary, and I wish, I desperately want to believe that you're right, but it just doesn't feel true. Well, guess what? I find and resolve those memories about dad that exactly match what feels true about God, and then I go and look at good pastoral teaching about how to understand the Old Testament, and there actually is some really good teaching about perspective on that and ways in which in that culture it was actually moving, it was progress. I mean, there's just lots of profound insights that before always felt like, yeah, I appreciate your attempt to make excuses for a crazy person, and I desperately wish I could believe you, but it doesn't feel true. And I get rid of the memory anchor, and then it's like, oh, that makes sense. And what feels true about the character and heart of God in my gut changes hugely good when I get rid of the old memory anchored implicit memory source. And if you do that for a whole bunch of stuff, that's also, you know, spending time with Jesus and discovering that he's wonderful, seeing him smile, that's all good. And then getting rid of distorted perceptions of his character and heart, memory that are anchored in trauma. You get rid of a pile of those. And that's also going to do wonderful things for your actual relationship with God. So I'll just go through like two minutes each for 21 examples. So again, like, so dad, you know, dad would get triggered and like this, all of a sudden, the huge guy in charge of the universe can get angry and scary and I don't know why and it doesn't make sense and it seems unreasonable and overreacting, whatever. That's one. So the um, year and a half old, how do I get this? Let's see, Let's see if that works. Um, Year and a half old, mom had mono. She was pregnant. She couldn't get out of bed. My brother and I go to stay with friends. Um, so I'm pre-verbal, don't have language. Mom disappears for a month. And that's like four-year-old brother. He can remember it. It was terrible, but he understood. You know, she's sick. We're going to see her again. For me, it's just like, and when he remembers, every day, all day long, I just I say, where's mom? 500 times a day, every day for a month. And between just being hopeless to spare and crying, I mean, I'm just as a one and a half year old, Interestingly, when I would have a problem, a struggle, an issue, I would pray I would not perceive adequate help or presence, and it would feel true that God doesn't come, he's not here, I can call and call, he doesn't answer, and everything that felt true in those memories would feel true about God. And when I worked, as I worked through those memories, those perceptions about God's character and heart resolved right along with them. What do you know? Okay, here's another one. Um, so I noticed that, this is a fairly recent one, I was working away at anger. I mean, um, even when I'm triggered and angry, I've just had a prodigy gift of like being able to do the right thing no matter what since I was two. So like I don't act out, I don't yell, I don't do anything toxic, but you know, for the people who are close to me, the closest circle who are the only ones who ever see it, you know, I'm muttering bad words, you know, like, you know, this, you know, at inanimate objects, I wanted, you know, it's just such a pity that inanimate objects can't suffer consciously because 
that when your clipboard hides from you and you really, really need it, and it's just tormenting you on purpose, you should have the option of damning it to hell for eternal conscious torment, right? Absolutely. And if you notice that, that you have that thought, you should think to yourself, hmm, <laughs> I want to consciously tor torture inanimate objects for deliberately trying to ruin my day. I, the, I think, that, well, actually, if you, if you don't know about triggering at all, you just kind of think, oh, I'm nuts. Um, if you know about implicit memory, you just think, wow, that's, I mean, big clue here. We got a, there's a memory back there. And like, you know, how come it feels like somebody is trying to deliberately torment me? So I focus on that, bam, go back to a memory. You know, I'm laying on the, on the floor. My older brother is sitting on top of me, which is, that happened many, many times. And anytime we had a, a disagreement, if it kind of got physical, eventually I would be on the floor. My brother was big enough and old enough and built differently that he always won, always, 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 100%, zero times I ever won. And sort of during the rest, I mean, I was so scrappy and wiry that I would, I would almost at least escape sometimes, which is sort of satisfying to almost like win. But then after he just like totally pins me down, I can't move anymore. That didn't get that. It, it was less fun for me than for him. You know, always, always, always lose is less fun than always, always, always win. And so there'd be like, you know, a 30 minute gap where there's, OK, I'm done. Let me up. And he thought it was fun to just sit for a little bit longer. And then I would be screaming and yelling, threatening to kill him, you know, and then he wouldn't and then he wouldn't let me up because he was afraid I was going to, you know, <laughs> throw a brick at his head or whatever. So this, this would turn out the end of these scenarios would be he's sitting on me and I'm just thrashing and just feeling utterly like restrained, pinned down, can't move. This is this is not good. And the part that we get onto God is and nobody is coming and saying, hey, he, can you tell like when he's screaming like that, he's not having fun anymore? You need to get off him when he's like, something's wrong here, this is not okay. And what felt true when my computer would thwart me for the afternoon is I want to I want to smash the computer, but I also am intensely angry at God for not coming and helping. I go work on the memories with John Jr. sitting on me and that kind of crazy thing about Somebody is tormenting me, and you're just standing there watching. Goes away. Here's another one. So I'm three years old, and I had never seen inside a car trunk. And I can picture this memory. I mean, and the stories of how I got to these places because I didn't start usually with, "Oh, I'm triggered about God." It started with some other trigger, and I would get to the memory, and then it would, we'd look back and think, "Oh my goodness, look how that was connected." But I'm telling the stories this way because it's easier to do it faster and make sense. So. The memory was I'm three years old and I'm I, this big, back in the days when they had car trunks that you could put like five guys in there, you know, you could have a picnic inside the far car trunk. And it was like, that's somehow the cave of wonders. I'd somehow, it's like, oh, wow. And I'm just looking up over the edge of this car trunk and I can see my dad talking to one of his friends and he's not looking at me. But I'm thinking, well, he can, I mean, dad knows everything. You know, dad is like God. I mean, dad and God are omniscient and omnipotent and he knows everything, even though he's looking away from me. Of course, he knows I'm here. And those old, I don't know if any of you are, well, some of the older people, those old car trunks and they're kind of, the hinges are stiff. And I mean, you have to like, you know, whew, you know, and it's like a, and dad's like, you know, 6'2", 220 pounds, you know, and he would like do the, uh, whoo, bam, you know. So he's talking to his friend and I'm putting my head up over that, like, oh, the car trunk. And he reaches up and even as he's starting to bring the car trunk down, I'm thinking, Oh, well, he, of course, he's like God. He knows I'm here. He's going to, he'll, he'll stop it halfway down and let me get out of the way. Well, guess what? That's not true about Dad. So, thunk, it was a sickening sound. I mean, it was, a, you know, lots of blood and everybody's terrified. And, and uh, thankful I still have a little ridge across the top of my head. And at the end of that memory, it no longer felt true that God or Dad knows where I am and is able to protect me. And when I went back into that memory that got triggered from somewhere else, I realized, oh my goodness, that's where that changed. And I, I could feel it shift back. Dad, God bless him, was just, I mean, he was talking to somebody else. And God actually does know where I am. Memory anchored distortion about God's character and heart, abilities, whatever. Um, another one, little kid hearing sermons about, um, this is one that, once you think about it for a second, you realize that lots of the Bible and lots of appropriate sermon content is not G-rated. 
there's lots of stuff that's very appropriate for adults. For challenging adults, you have like a room full of 25 year olds and you want to challenge them to be radical to like Jesus did that with the grownups and like, you know, sell all you have, give to the poor. If he's talking to the one guy um, or he's, he uses kind of hyperbolic statements to emphasize how important your relation with God is. If your foot or your hand is in the way, just like chop it off, throw it away, pluck out your eye, which is all like adults get that. But if you're a three year old in that sermon and the grumps just totally it never occurred to them, they're preaching R rated sermons to three year olds. And it's just like, this is a terrifying deal. And the, the basic summary there was like, God quote unquote loves me and has a horrible plan for my life. Um, <laughs> And his, his will for me is to, you know, like, just, like, sell all I have, walk out of the house somewhere. Um, don't know where you go anyway. And, like, if you notice that your eye or your hand or your foot is causing you to sin, like, chop it off, pluck it out. I'm like, I could figure out enough, like, I mean, at least my hand and my feet would get involved in trouble. And how can you tell if it's causing you to sin? I mean, would it help? How can you tell? Like, if, have you reached the point where cutting off your hand is actually going to help you be more holy or righteous? And, I mean, I, it was terrifying. I mean, Christianity was like toxic waste. And... As I, when I found, I, in a healing session or whatever, I went back to those memories, and for the first time, it was so funky, I never, it, like somehow, at some level, it never really registered, like that, that was all like serious trauma, and I didn't, somehow I hadn't, it had just gotten kind of buried in the way we kind of just try not to think about the stuff that's disturbing, that like, there's a bunch of these specific childhood memories of being three years old in these radical discipleship sermons that was just totally traumatic. And I connect with those, and I'm like, oh my gosh, crying, having the emotions. And I just sense all of a sudden, that's just all, like, it just, it all shifted. The adult truth was able to connect. And I'm like, oh, God's not a crazy, terrifying, like, psychotic cult leader. Which really helps with the whole relationship intimacy thing. If you don't think he's a terrifying, psychotic cult leader, it's easier to get close to him. Um, so, here's one, makes complete sense. Uh, a couple of these are other people. This, so I've, this is one that I've seen with lots of different people I've prayed with. If you were traumatized by men in your childhood, it can kind of get it can get in the way of being intimate with Jesus now. And the thought of like, the, there's been a whole number of people when I first go at the the whole idea of oh, I want to help you experience the living presence of Jesus in the room. And at some kid place in there, the immediate response was that's a bad idea, you know. You know, I don't want a strange man in the room with me. That, that has not turned out well in the past. Let's not do it. And you find the memory anchor. And here's what was, it takes some skill. This is more advanced work to how to, when someone has that blockage, how to help them get to the place where they're able to say, oh, yes, this fear is coming from a specific memory. And there's, you can figure out some way. Can we just test going in there? Can we find a way to do it that's safe? We'll ask Jesus to be on the other side of the room. I mean, you negotiate conditions to be able to let them get to the place of, okay, Jesus, you can show me the memory where this fear comes from, and I ask that you would be there with me. And every single time, they'll, oh, Dad is here yelling at me, and Jesus is over here, and he's on my side. He's, I can feel the love and the safety coming from Jesus, and Dad, I'm terrified of Dad. And they go in the memory, and they immediately recognize, oh, Jesus is not Dad. Dad is scary and intoxicated and bad. Jesus is on my side. And what's really fascinating is you get three or five or eight of those, and they may have like 500 traumatic memories of being traumatized by men. But if you just get five of them where they actually experience inside the memory, Jesus is not dad. Dad is intoxicated and bad. Jesus is loving and safe on my side. They'll, they'll pop apart, and they'll still have more men trauma memories to get rid of being afraid of men in general. But the transference onto Jesus... It will, it will often break apart after only a handful of actually going inside the memory anchors and they experience inside the memory, Jesus is going on my side. And then you suggest, oh, hey, let's do a manual. We're gonna, I want to help you experience the presence of Jesus. Their gut immediate response is, that's a good idea instead of that's a bad idea. Again, that's like a, a pretty, you can get, oh, I can see how that would help the whole relationship intimacy thing. Okay. Um, playground, so I'll just I'll give these in like three sentences and you'll have to just work hard to try to understand them. So a, a bunch of these, the piece that would get transferred onto God, and there'll be a, a, a package of traumatic stuff 
that'll have different themes in it. You know, cheaters are bad and these things are scary and, you know, friends can't be trusted or whatever. And some of the stuff that doesn't, doesn't really transfer so easily onto God, but in lots and lots of these memories, the piece that the grown-ups in charge should have been protecting me and they weren't, you say, oh, that piece is going to go right onto God. You know, here we are in the playground, kids are cheating, and the gym teacher is strangely blind. You know, kind of like he doesn't want to deal with it. It would make his job harder to like actually enforce justice. And strangely, for much of my life, it would feel true that God just sits there and watches people cheat. As opposed to, like, I can't trust justice to him. I need to hang on to bitterness. I mean, I need to keep the score myself because I know he's not. He just, he's just, he's just, he's right there. He's in charge and he's just watching these kids cheat. So obviously he's not going to do anything about it. I need to. What do you know? Um, wrongly judged, punished by, no, so another one for, for lots of people. If every time something went wrong in their childhood, the parent person would walk in and immediately blame them, accuse them, judge them, and punish them, and it was, it was never fair. I mean, if their experience was, anytime something bad happens, I'm going to get blamed and punished and judged. And you say, okay, let's go into this traumatic memory, and we're going to invite Jesus to be in there with you, and he's going to help. It's like, no, he's going to blame me and assume it's my fault and punish me and judge me. This is a bad idea. Same story with the, with the men trauma thing. You get, you get in the memory, oh, Jesus is not fill in the blank. My principal, my first grade teacher, my father, my intoxicated uncle, whatever, whoever it was that blamed them and judged them and punished them. Crack it apart, and then they have more healing to do. But when you suggest, let's get Jesus here, they say, that's a good idea. So, um, oh yeah, so Jesus, um, my childhood, 1960s, my parents were wonderful, well-intentioned, you know, progressive, radical, social justice, social worker, education kind of people. So they would have, a, if, if a bully was, was terrorizing you in the playground, they wanted to have a meeting. You know, let's, let's have a meeting and talk to his parents. Yeah, right. And, and it's, like, it's like, the stupidity of these grown-ups is just astonishing. <laughs> that it, it's, Yeah, and it didn't occur to them to actually protect the child the next day on the playground, you know. And that happens once, and we all get it. It's like, you know, they're, they're idiots. I mean, they're well-intentioned. You know, they have meetings. They have went to graduate school, whatever. But, like, they will not protect you from the bullies. You're on your own. Same thing. God's not going to be there. Not going to protect me. Transfer to the cross. Um, God the politician. Lots of promises. But they, when it comes to delivery time, there's just it's excuses and bl- they always make excuses and blame people. So, oh, I'm, if, if ask me for anything, I'll help you. Okay, God, um, I would actually this this would be, I need help here. I, I can't see an answer. Oh, well, that's because you don't pray in His name. It's because it's like they blame you and make excuses. I'm like, yep. No, thank you, God. Just like the politicians, and you get rid of the childhood. I'm just it's, the world is hopeless because the people in charge are you can't are not trustworthy. You get rid of that, and then it's like, oh the understanding about all the complexity and nuances about prayer, the truth actually feels true when you get rid of your memory anchored trauma about untrustworthy politicians. So similar, um, oh, the drugged out hippie, they even dressed like Jesus. He's like, oh yeah, he loves you, and I'll offer you, a, hey, you can want some of my, some of my, here, you can share, you know, oh, he's sharing, he loves you, whatever. But like, this is not a guy who's gonna fix the problems for you. You know, I'm looking around. It's a five years old. The world is a mess. We need help. You know, I don't need somebody who's like, peace, love, man. It's like, thank you very much. Just get out of my way. You have no idea what's going on here. You don't even have a job, let alone a plan to fix the world. And uh, angry activists, like, people would come to our church holding a Bible, and they're reading the red letters, right? And even as, like, a five-year-old, I knew what that meant. And they're saying angry things like, you know, with the least of these, I mean, so basically, you, middle class Americans, that you haven't given all your money away to the poor people, and you're basically going to hell, because Jesus has come back and said, there were some poor people that you did not feed, and you're screwed. I'm like, that was, you know, people represent, claiming to represent Jesus, holding a Bible, quoting his words, and like, wow, this is bad. Um, gym teachers in high school who, again, like, they throw out a soccer ball, and they go read Sports Illustrated and do their paperwork. 
And like, so they just leave the kids unsupervised to like do something. And sometimes, you know, they would do constructive stuff. But other times, like the, one of the things for my chef, freshman year is it's like, you know, the soccer goals are big. And it's like when you're in high school and, and it's easier to get past the goalie than to hit the goalie. So there, the game was soccer dodgeball. So like you put somebody like me in the goal and then you all try to hit him. And if you think a big kid can throw a dodgeball hard enough to hurt, try kicking a soccer ball. So again, like where the grown-ups watch reading Sports Illustrated in their office, taking catch up on their paperwork, along with God, who I don't trust to take care of me. And oh golly, so and there's a whole uh, five or six or seven more that I'm not going to get to, but you get the idea that, and, and part of why I make a big list there is like we've probably all been to conferences. Oh, I, have, I have trouble with my relationship with God the Father. Oh well, how is your relationship with your earthly father? Wow, I never thought of that question. Um, but it's a, that's a good question. That's like, you know, the first day of the first grade emotional healing class, they talk about if you had, you know, a trauma with your father, that's going to get on to God. We kind of get that. And you kind of feel like if you've dealt with that one, you're taken care of. And my, my word is every possible trauma that the enemy can in any possible way get on to God, you know, if I was on the other team, that'd be a no-brainer. And if you poke around and pay attention at all, you'll discover it's not you know, three nice, easy to find examples about your dad. It's like, it's your first grade teacher, it's your principal, it's your mom, it's your dad, it's any authority figure, it's your preacher, it's the, it's the, it's the gym teacher, it's the coach, it's the Boy Scout leader, it's the drill sergeant, it's the employer. I mean, there are memories everywhere that get transferred onto the Lord. And if you have a lifestyle of healing, you shuffle those out. And I can guarantee you, as you get rid of those memory anchored hindrances, your relationship and intimacy with Jesus will go in this direction and every aspect of spiritual growth will go up.